please just give it up for our panel. Jump right in and, and ask a few questions. Uh, Rick, we're so glad to have you today. Please tell us about the evolution of this amazing documentary and your relationship with uh, Martin Luther. Well, um, the documentary kind of started uh, when I was in prison and um, I was thinking about my life. You know, uh, I was getting a life sentence. Uh, and I was wondering how could I help other kids that might be going down the same road that I was going down. Um, I read a book about Tookie Williams when, when he was being executed. Uh, and Tookie grew up in my neighborhood as well. You know, he was somebody that I looked up to as a youth. Um, and I just started thinking about how could I take my story and do like Tookie did with his story and share it with other kids that may be thinking about going down the drug uh, lane. And uh, I just started writing notes and, 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 and studying about the movie business. And one day uh, I thought about doing a documentary uh, and it just so happened that a friend of mine who I've been talking to on the phone told me that she knew Mark. And, um, and she made the introduction and Mark came down, her and Mark came down and we talked about it. Uh, and it just grew from there. Mm -hmm. What's interesting um, with the film, because I want to kind of open it up a little bit, uh, with the work that's going on in Claremont Lincoln University, we're looking at, uh, we have three uh, MA programs, master's degree programs, social impact, there's ethical leadership, which is extremely relevant today, and there's the interfaith action program. But one of the, the points of consideration that each one of the programs kind of weaves and looks at is society. And, you know, going through and reading, you know, your book, and also fleshing through Gary Reb's book, you gotta read this, Dark Alliance, it's heavy. It's the conversation around societal failure and how society fails so many within communities, especially you, impoverished communities throughout the country, but not only throughout the country, but around the world. And I just kinda wanna open it up and, and ask a serious question. Do you feel as if your community or society in general, when you were coming up, failed you? Uh, absolutely. Um, I believe that society not only fails us, but it brainwashes us. It's, it's like a double-headed sword. On one hand, you tell the kids not to sell drugs, but then on the other hand, you have on the radio uh, guys who are bragging about the wealth that they created from selling drugs. And then you have a kid who's in poverty, you know, who uh, mother is badly able to pay the rent, the lights getting cut off, people put eviction notices on their door, and then you tell them, well, you don't participate. But uh, you let these other guys brag about how much money they're able to make. And it's, it's really tempting for, uh, for anybody, you know, uh, to get involved. You know, so, like, we're thinking about the American dream came up a couple of times in the film, the notion that I can get more, I can be better, I want a little bit more than what's around me. If all I see are broken windows and, and, and folks who are unemployed and don't have, then I'm wondering how I can get to the next level to have a little bit something. But at the same time, we put ourselves at risk and also put the community at risk. In a way, I'm thinking about flipping the question around and now asking, how do we fail our communities? What is it that we do? Because the old saying, hurt people hurt people, in a sense. Right, right. Well, I, I think that we hurt our community when we don't get involved. Uh, if you're not there to help fix the problem, then you're just as bad as the people who, who are actually creating the problem. I mean, that's, what, that's the way I see it, and that's why I work so hard to do what I do, because uh, I feel that if I'm not the one who's setting the tone for fixing the problem, then nobody else should do it. Um, <clears throat> it was a thing my lawyer said to me one day we were in the visiting room, and it really drove me to studying the law harder than I'd ever studied before. He said that any time somebody else wants for you more than you want it for yourself, then you're in trouble. And what I took from that, that he meant that if I expected somebody else to come into my community, and straighten up my community, and then I was in for a rude awakening. 
in the um, in your book, you open up in you know you, you didn't hide it. You, you you spoke candidly in your book about not being able to read or write by the eleventh grade in particular, and you were an excellent still are an excellent tennis player. <laughs> And the fact of the matter that you reached the 11th grade here in the United States of America and could not read or write speaks volumes to how the educational system pushed you along. Now, one thing that I was thinking about last night is that your story, on some levels, is pretty much a microcosm of so many other stories. Absolutely. Of so many other stories. And I'm wondering to myself, the tens of thousands of folks in California right now, especially those in black and brown communities that were passed along and pushed along. So with that said, 11th grade, you're talking to the coach at Long Beach State? Yes. And he's interested in bringing you on board, playing for the university, and you confess to him. I cannot read or write. Yep. The devastation that took place. So how important is it right now? Because we're thinking about different programs and institutes and, and, and nonprofit organizations that we should go out and develop, that we should think about how to structure and design. How important is literacy in the 21st century right now, especially with you? Well, I think that it's absolutely um, necessary because uh, once I learned how to read, whole other world started opening up to me. Even though I was in prison, um, <clears throat> if you get a chance to uh, read an article Jesse Katz did on me uh, in LA Magazine that came out, and he talked about when he came to visit me in prison that I was more buoyant than he had ever saw me before. And one of the reasons that I felt like that is because my mind had been opened to a level that it had never been opened before. And even those prison walls couldn't confine it. They had my body, but they didn't have my mind. My mind had been to China, had to India. Uh, I had been places that I never thought about going before because uh, I really came consumed with reading. Reading became my passion. Uh, if I wasn't uh, on the weight pile, lifting weights, uh, walking the track, or playing basketball, I would be laying on my bunk reading a book after I, after I knew that, that I was getting out of prison. Uh, so I spent a lot of time reading. Some weeks I would read three books a week. And I just kept cramming all this information into my brain and, and it just opened me up to some things that I had never thought about, never dreamed about. I mean, even these books took me back to where I analyzed my own life. They made me go back and analyze Ricky Ross, you know, uh, how I came up, why was I doing the things what I, what that I was doing, you know. It sent me back to the movie Superfly the first time that I ever heard about cocaine. Uh, took me back to the day that my friend Mike laid the first two lines of cocaine on the table for me. So, books showed me that. You know, books taught me the law of attraction. Uh, books taught me that I willed myself to prison. You know, a lot of people ask me, they say, Rick, why did you keep selling drugs? Because I really didn't spend the money. I don't spend money. Anybody that that's around me to tell you, you know, oh, Rick don't spend money. You know, I'm not, um, I like making money, but I just use it as a tool. Well, after I had $3 million, people were saying, well, why did you keep selling drugs when you had more money than, than you wanted? Well, in the back of my mind, I had put in my mind that I was going to prison. And I had to fulfill that desire. Even though consciously I was saying, I don't want to go to prison, but what I learned about the law of attraction, whatever's on your mind the most, even though you might be dodging it, <laughs> um, it comes. You just bring it to yourself. So I learned that I will myself into prison, and from those same books, I learned that I could will my way out of prison. And you know, I, I credit that with me being here today. That that I learned those laws, and I started to practice them. Roberto, I want to bring you into the conversation, and uh, I want us to think a little bit about you know ethical leadership, ethical decisions, and you um, have an amazing story in this film. But 
I'm thinking about, you know, if you could expand a little bit about the importance of making ethical decisions in a split second, in a split second, either do I take it or do I not take it? If I don't take it, then I'm just as dirty as everybody else. Or if I take it, I'm all in. And with the ethical leadership program, uh, the conversation uh, centers around you know for-profit institutions and also non-profit institutions and training and you know leaders uh, around the world because our students are all over the world. We have online-based online platform. So I'm thinking, how important is it that one sticks to the right side, and how hard is it to stick to the right side in your particular case? Or how hard was it at that particular time? In, in my particular case, you might say we did the wrong thing for the right reasons. We started off working the uh, cocaine dealers and we're working money launderers, Colombian dope dealers, Bolivian dope dealers, people that were bringing in multiple kilos. We sat around one day and we all wore the county issued vest and the big joke was the crook has to be a good shot for you to hit the vest because it only covered this much of the chest. Everything else was exposed. So we decided more or less, we're going, we're going like Reagan. We're going to take drug money and put it to good use. He gave it to the Contras. We went out and bought weapons and good entry vests and bought as many weapons as we could carry that were heavy firepower. That was unethical, obviously. That money was supposed to go to the county, and the county was going to take care of us eventually, if at all, and give us the tools that we needed to do our job. But you cannot hold off on a search warrant ethically until you get the proper equipment when your supervisors are telling you you need to do a search warrant every 10 days and bring the money in. They stop mentioning the drugs. It's bring the money in we need it for the county. Like LAPD, it became part of their budget, all the money that they were seizing. That was paying for overtime. The LA County was the same thing. So unethically, we went ahead and did that. The other thing was we need to get statistics. I'm sure all of you as educated as you are know what statistics are. How many students are graduating? How many students are doing this? With us is how many dope dealers are you putting in jail and how often are you doing it? How many kilos are you seizing to make sure this guy gets put away for a long time? So you have to keep the stats up if you want to keep your job, even though ethically that isn't the way police work is supposed to be. But that's just the law of the jungle. That's the rule. You tell the public one thing, and inside you do what you have to to put people in jail. The public doesn't need to know. The public in general is ignorant of what's really going on in police work. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that decides to become a cop at that point makes a decision, I'm going to do whatever it takes to put a crook in jail. But when the pressure's on you, to make arrests, then you start making decisions that are unethical. So it seems like right now there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a disconnect you know, between communities in the U.S. I mean, we look at Ferguson, we look at Baltimore, I mean, we look at Los Angeles. I mean, but in general, around the various riots that have been taking place due to police brutality and what have you, how can we think about possibly mending the disconnect? Where do we start? with making that disconnect the same place right now. You can start off by, just let me give an example. When I became a police officer, I was living in Guala Heights, which is a Mexican barrio, neighborhood, hood, whatever you want to call it. When I became a deputy sheriff, I felt a little boost of ego. I had moved myself out of that neighborhood. I was gonna raise my children in a better neighborhood. I felt elated, I was a better person. With police officers that I knew, I'm not speaking for everyone, they looked at suspects as not really being human. They're just the number that you're going to take to jail. He makes a mistake, he gets arrested, he goes to jail, it's over there for you. That's not a person, that's a suspect. That's who it is. A lot of officers have grown up in neighborhoods where they were never exposed to being in a street fight. They never got, excuse the expression, their butt kicked and went home to heal. I did. I was not afraid to throw down with the suspect. If a suspect took a swing at me, I didn't reach for my gun. I reached for my baton or my sap and I beat him as hard as I could because I was not going to get paid to get beat. It's that simple. 
And the question that goes to a lot of people is, how much money are you willing to take <coughs> as a salary to stand there and get punched around or get shot? What's your price? It's a two-edged sword. You're asking a police officer to put his life on the line, but you're not going to pay him enough for it, and then you want him to take the guy that's killing people off the street at the same time, but be gentle. Okay? People don't understand when a person is violent, you can't come up to him and say, look, sweetheart, let's talk. What's really bothering you today? Meanwhile, your radio in your black and white is blasting. You have three more calls that you have to get to that require immediate assistance. So what do you do? See, general public doesn't know that. They figure you get one call, you got all day to take care of it. No, you don't. So those are the things that the community needs to know that it's, we, the police officer has rules to follow. What rules does the community follow? There's rules for both sides. If you listen when an officer tells you to get off the sidewalk, he doesn't have to take you to jail for interfering. It's, it's two sides. Coach Ward, you are the executive director at uh, Union One Foundation. Uh, how are you uh, engaging with the community, with the youth? Um, how are you preparing them? How is your organization preparing the youth, uh, you know, this generation to, in a sense, stay alive and keep going? Well, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity, too. Uh, Unity One, again, was founded uh, in 1992 by Bo Taylor, a very good friend of mine passed away of cancer, and uh, another good friend of mine, which is Pete Carroll, head football coach at Seattle Seahawks, asked me to come in and support the agency, and uh, basically I said no, because I felt that I was trying to get away from that lifestyle, but as, as, as God would have it, uh, I ended up going uh, right after it, really, really extremely hard. Uh, my everyday living is about speaking life into these babies, uh, particularly the young sisters, uh, because you know, the number one crime in America right now is human sex trafficking. And so when I look at them, and I have seven girls of my own, I'm married 32 years, and um, well, you know, I got five, five of my daughters are married, uh, college graduates, and uh, my baby is 19, she's a sophomore at Cal Poly, uh, right up the street, and she's made the dean list. But I think the, re the result of that, of me living in what we call the hood, is because we had both parents, we loved our kids, we were responsible for their actions. Uh, we just we just held it together uh, through all the struggles. Because remember, I was in the dope game uh, with Rick, you know, for those four years too. And when that stuff went away, you know, uh, uh, you went right back to problems. You went right back to hard times. And I think what happens is they said, uh, tough times don't last, but tough people do. So I know that it was definitely God that saved me for myself. Uh, it wasn't me who saved me. I'm not that good. Uh, but, I, but I'm grateful and I'm, and I'm thankful that uh, that's what has taken place. I mean, I got, I remember if you watch the documentary, and it showed you where I said the tragedy took place and I found that I was academically ineligible. Uh, the computer came back and said that I was 23 units and a half, needed 24. Well, when I came back, uh, well, right after the cricket cops at that time uh, beat me, primarily half to them, uh, and I called my old coach and I said, hey, coach, can I come back to school? And he said, yeah, as long as you leave the streets behind you. Uh, so I was a good kid that did something wrong. I wasn't, I wasn't always a bad kid. And uh, so when I went back to go, to go to the administration office to pull out a printout to see where I was academically, I had 24 units. So I really did something when I was academically eligible, but the computer said that I wasn't. So I know that it was God who actually placed me in that environment and got me through it. It wasn't me. See, now that's, that's my belief. You know, everybody not a believer. 
And it's important that we that we make sure that these babies understand that mom and daddy ain't gonna always be there, but God is always gonna be there. So to have a better chance with God versus a mama and a daddy, even though I had that in my family. Um, so again, a question raised in regards to how we deal with our babies on a daily is uh, conflict resolution. Obviously, we do hardcore intervention. We go into houses. Uh, we, we have a license to operate, meaning that uh, I wasn't a gang member. I was considered a gangster, uh, an American gangster. And I don't even know how I got that, but you know, uh, I mean, I, I didn't even know that I was going to be an American gangster, right? So. Eighty percent, eighty percent of the drugs that came into California, this gentleman controlled. So therefore, eighty percent of the guys that were employed that was in gangs were for me, because you know we're providing these things all over the city, and then we, then becoming all over the state. So you're not working for me uh, directly, but indirectly, because if I gave it to you and you gave it to him and he gave it to him or he gave it to her, eventually it still came back to me. So when you talk about what took place and, and, and be known to any of us that our government was behind it all, then guess who we work for? Because the professor said from UCLA that that was complicity, right? That was a part of it, meaning that if somebody uh, uh, robbed a store and you were in the car and you didn't know that they were robbing the store, you still, the police ain't gonna just let you get away with that. You gotta go to church like everybody else. So. Again, for our young babies, is, is they know the temperament of their own friends. You know when somebody doing something wrong, you know? And, and I know it's tough because you don't want to be no snitch, because snitches, snitches, snitches and all that old crazy stuff, so, you know, that's, that's the same. But you do have to make better choices uh, when, you, when it comes up, when, you, when, when, you, when you're in that particular situation, and it's going to happen, particularly more for the babies. Uh, I always say that the devil ain't, ain't after me no more, but he's definitely after our babies. He's definitely after our children. Because we're, we're just not in that mindset, in that spiritual mindset anymore. Okay. okay. At this time, I want to open up the floor for questions. I wanted to ask about um, crooked cops. Is there, any, is there any way to go back? Is it the nature of the police department that brings out the worst in people? It isn't the nature of the police department, and I understand the majority of the people that you see on the news are blacks that are being shot. There are just as many Mexicans that are being shot and killed. They don't make the news. In the 70s and the 80s, when I was a cop, things were a little different. People, believe it or not, respected law enforcement. This is what I was told when I became a cop. If you want to be respected, by the people that you deal with, you don't take any of their lip. You tell them what they're supposed to do, they're the ones that called you. As law progressed, people started learning about their rights. I have a right to this, I have a right to that. You cannot tell me this, you cannot tell me that. So what they've done is they've removed the power of the police officer to enforce the laws that the very citizens that call them want in place. So what is a cop supposed to do? Now you've tied his hands. The problem with the shootings nowadays, in my opinion, you're hiring people to be policemen who have never been in a fight in their life. They've never been struck even by their parents. Now my boys know what it is to get spanked. I didn't hold back. But now you get this kid, he's 23 years old, intelligent, great physical shape, and nobody's ever laid a hand on him. He gets out there and a five foot six Mexican tells him, you're not taking me to jail, I'm gonna kick your butt. Now he's been threatened for the first time in his life or her life. What do they do? They have all this academy training, you take this hold and you grab that hold and you grab them from here. <coughs> Excuse me, they go to grab the guy and the guy steps back and gets into a combative stance, now what do you do? First thing that comes in their mind is fear. Any one of you can go walk out here and somebody can come up to you and say, I'm gonna beat the living hell out of you. If you've never been in a fight, you're gonna panic. And a lot of police officers panic. 
So rather than say, okay, you want to fight? There's two ways you go. You either get in a car or you go to the hospital. You threaten back, you get to the same level or higher than the person you're dealing with. That's what we used to do. The guy said, no, I'm not going. Then you draw out your baton, you say, you're gonna go. The minute the guy says no, you take out his legs, you take out his arm, you get him to the ground, you handcuff him, he's out to jail. It's over. He's gonna have problems, he's gonna have bruises. Of course, in Rick's case, they were trying to kill him, and I know that for a fact, as I was told, we're gonna kill this guy. So that's the difference. But that wasn't every cop. <coughs> Select few were willing to drop the hammer on somebody just because they pissed them off. The majority of cops back then were, if I gotta fight you, I'm gonna fight you, but you're going to jail. Nowadays, with the young people that are afraid to get hit, what's the first thing they're gonna do? I got a gun with nine rounds. You're not gonna hit me. So they draw the gun thinking that's gonna scare them. It's not gonna scare them. The guy's gonna taunt, or the woman is gonna taunt you and say, shoot me, my family will be rich. Yeah. It may come as a shock to you, but that's what they're hearing on the street. You don't hear that in the news. Okay? You wanna find out what it's like? Go talk to a cop that's been in patrol for a while. Then you'll know. It isn't that the policemen are changing, they are to a certain degree, but the civilians that you're dealing with feel that their knowledge of the law is enough for them to do whatever the hell they want to do and you can't touch them. That's where the change. Are there some specific skills maybe beyond hand-to-hand -hand combat that we can teach law enforcement that might make a difference? <clears throat> the one skill that I can bring to mind is this. We talk about ethics. Ethics come from the chief of police or the sheriff down. Okay. Everyone knows you get promoted according to the type of work you do or your condition of the job that you get, and that's how you get promoted. The better you are, the higher the promotion. From the top down, the ones that are doing the work that make the sheriff look good or the captain look good or the chief of police are who? You're lying deputies. If the sheriff wants to look good, he talks to his commander, who talks to his chief, who talks to his captain, who talks to his lieutenant, who talks to the police officer on the street and says, we need more arrests. So the pressure's coming from the top. You want ethics? Promote the man to sheriff based on his knowledge of the law and his ability to run a large department, not on the number of arrests that they make. Promote them based on crime prevention, which entails sometimes the officers getting out into the community and learning who the people are and realizing they're human. They're going through things right now that I never went through, so I can't live like they do, but I can help them. And that's how it changes. Um, now, I've, I've just, just listened to the answer, and I've actually been on the, on the other end Whereas an innocent been arrested by, by police officers, accused of stealing my own car, after getting beaten, also accused of assaulting police and the execution of his duty. Um, fortunately, you know, the, um, the, it, it did not prevail. I was, I was uh, found not guilty because I wasn't guilty. And so I think there's another side to the police story. <laughs> there's another side to the police story. And I do understand that there is a job to be done but as um, an, an, an African in America, I was actually raised in Angry, this happened in Angry, but I've had incidents over here too. As an African in America, I know that it's not simply a matter of police not getting the respect, because particularly in black neighborhoods, we find that police don't give respect. But my um, question is directed to Rick and Cornell, and it has to do with your experience being on the other end of of the police in Los Angeles and wondering how close your experience to, was to mine. I know you guys were involved in things that you should not have been doing, um, but, but how, how was it growing up in black Los Angeles uh, dealing with the police officers? Were they seen as friends, as advocates? Uh, what, what is your experience? Because I think if we're going to move towards some sort of healing, then we need to hear from both sides. Well. Um it was pretty tough. Uh, 
uh, like it still is. Uh, you know, when I knew that I was doing wrong, so we, we looked at that. That come with the territory. If they caught you, you got hit across your head. You know, we, that's just how you look at it when you're doing wrong. Uh, however, the time uh, that you seen in the documentary, uh, Rick was just taking me to the house uh, to drop me off. We wasn't doing anything wrong at that, at that present time. And they were there, like you said, uh, to set them up or to set us up. And they did. I mean, it cost me 32 stitches, teeth knocked out, broke arm, and the skin taken off the side of my face. But that, again, we wasn't doing anything wrong at that present time, you know. Like, that's just how that. Well, one of the things I think is that the cops can't take their job personal. You know, you have to go into a job um, almost like a surgeon. You know, when a surgeon goes into a surgery, he can't think about, am I going to kill this guy? Is this guy going to live or die? No, you go in and you do your job the best that you can. And I believe that that's the way law should be enforced. In, a lot of times they take their job personal, you know. Say for instance with me, uh, everywhere I went with law enforcement, because of who I was, they treated me different, you know. Uh, even though I have no violence in my background at all, they always black box me every time I travel, you know. I wouldn't be allowed to uh, uh, be in the open with the regular inmates because of my name and, and the, the level of, of my crime. Um, and, and I believe that a lot of that was because the cops had took it personal. You know, they didn't deal with it as if, hey, this guy's committing crime, we're gonna lock him up by the law, and once we do that, we're done with it. Uh, sometimes cops take their job personal, you know, and, and, and I believe that once you start to take things personal, then it's no longer uh, about the job that you do, it's about you satisfying your personal desires and, and your personal needs, and I think that there's no place in, in business, and law should be done like a business. Uh, um, because you have to be blind to color, uh, community, uh, all of that. It's just, I'm just doing my job. You know, if a guy runs a red light, I'm going to give him a ticket for running a red light. You know, I'm not going to make him sit on the curve uh, uh, because he's a black guy, because he's driving a nice car, because he has nice clothes, he has jewelry on. None of that stuff should matter. Uh, I think that. Once we get law enforcement just to stick with the law, I think it'll be a lot better. Rick has a good point in, in that. When I give my lectures to the LAPD regarding corruption, I tell them exactly the same thing. I said, don't take this job personal. You, so one officer told me, he says, well, what do you do when every week or every three or four months you're arresting the same guy for doing drugs in the same area at the same time? I said, take him to jail. That's what he wants. If he wants to do life three or four months at a time, that's his decision. Your job is take him to jail, you're done. Don't take it personal. He's not family. You don't live next door to him. You don't live in that neighborhood. Do what you gotta do and go home. Speaking of Chicago, that's where I'm from. Okay. And uh, I also share your, your faith values as well. And my question is, you have an opportunity right now in a diverse, audience to of change agents we are change agents or we wouldn't be here so what would you say you anyone on the panel how do we as a change agent in our vi environment and some of us are in an environment of means help out and connect the means environment with the needs well for me um Again, I always go back to my spiritual belief. Amen. Is that you get an uh, amen, brother? <laughs> is that uh, yeah. we got to go to the restroom? We'll be right back. <laughs> that, that's my guy. <laughs> okay, George, it's all yours. I'm heading out the door. <laughs> all right, but but again, uh, if one um, seriously believes, I think that he understands. What, what takes place in the world. And I think it says that the, the, the light, the, the, the field is plentiful, meaning that there's a lot, but there's only a few laborers, meaning that there's not many of us who's gonna go out there and do the work. 
I'm just grateful and thankful that I've been chosen to go out and do the work. I'm not going to talk about nobody that's not doing it. I'm just going to keep doing my part. And I think if everyone has an opportunity in the room to do their part, it'll help save a life. That's why I'm at with it. And going along with the um, question that my friend over here was asking about the involvement of faith communities, what can the community leaders uh, you know, if you have you ever been approached before by community leaders or faith leaders to oh, help you uh, organize and protest or something like that? I think. Well, I am a faith leader. <laughs> I mean, that's what that's how I look at it. I am a faith leader. But at the same time, uh, in LA and South Central, where, where Rick and I and, and even over is where we from, uh, the churches is like nine to five. You can't get in them. They they look like jails in some cases. You know, it's a living stone church on every corner in the hood. You know, so my, you know, my baby don't. I mean, when I was coming up, you, a church would be open because they know that somebody needed some help. But now you can't get in there if you don't dress right, if you don't smell right, if you don't look right. You, they'll push you right on down the street and, and don't pay your tithes and see what happens. You know, they'll push you right on out. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I speak the truth to power. So, you know, it's important that the pastors, I tell them all the time, is that you've got to come from, uh, well, I, I, I don't say it like that, I say it like this. I said, man, Jesus didn't save nobody inside the church. He saved somebody on the outside. So get out there and do the work. You know, because they won't. They'll just sit up in there, up in the high rising, and, and say, come on, and drop something in the hat. And our babies are still sick and still needing help, and, you know, and, and, and you know how I go. You know how church folks is. Church folks always talk about somebody. You know, the baby's on the back of the skirt too high. He said, come as you are. You supposed to have your, your protective blinders on if you're in this seat up here anyway. You're not supposed to be looking at that baby like that that way. You know. I'd like to add something to that too. When I got home, uh, Cornell's organization was well funded when I first got home. And I saw something that was amazing to me that they were doing. They had went around, and, and it was almost the same thing I did when I sold drugs. I just went to the community, went to the leader of that neighborhood, and gave the leader drugs to sell, and taught him how to sell drugs. But when I got home, they were doing almost the same thing, but they was giving the guys the money, telling them to patrol your neighborhood, and, and if something was wrong in the neighborhood, they would have a meeting with all of these leaders from the different neighborhoods and they were able to, to keep a lot of the violence down and, and at that time I think that it, it was going really well. Oh, well they lost their funding. I think when Pete Curl got uh, hired by the Seattle Seahawks he was no longer that C and he no longer needed the community support. Uh, he took his program to Seattle with him and left Cornell the program high and dry. Uh, which I thought that the program could have been built even more because one of the things that I saw that could have happened is that they could have went in and taught these guys what I learned while I was in prison, which could have took it to even another level. Uh, uh, um, so, so really, everything that we need has already been done before. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, but it's going to be up to the community to figure out what it is that needs to be done and then adjust to it. And when you say our community leaders, um, I don't think that they, they do a lot of lip service, you know. Uh, I've been wanting a situation to where I could get 15 to 20 kids and show them what could happen to them if somebody took the time out and nourished them and, 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 and gave them the kind of attention that they need. Uh, but nobody has been willing to help me with that situation, you know. So. Uh, I don't think that, that um, the community leaders are really interested in, in, in uh, saving our community. That's an interesting point you make because uh, it goes back to Cornell's around the failure of religious institutions in society. And I think that many of us can agree that a number of religious institutions have failed, especially in the United States, around uh, issues around poverty, uh, around drugs, violence, and gang intervention. But at the same time, we flip the coin and we see some that are actually in the hood, that are actually working on projects, but those numbers are limited. Um, just kind of generating some thought, Cornell, 
mean, what do some of these churches need to do? I know they need to kind of move beyond 5.30 as the closing hour to open up the doors 24-7. But, <laughs> I mean, what do some uh, faith leaders in particular, not just Christian pastors, but all around the board need to do, especially well, like in the interface circle? Well, I, I tell you, uh, again, I go back to Mr. Stone. He said, man, I'm, I'm, I'm heavy on these numbers and statistical data. Well, when I was a senior at Cal State Northridge College, um, one of my studies was to see how many uh, churches we had in the hood. We had 874 uh, minority churches in the community which I grew up in, grossing $55 million every Sunday. But yet still, we live in a pit full of hell. What did that tell you? Nobody has forgiveness, you know, and nobody really wants to serve at, like they're supposed to. I'm not asking nobody to do over and beyond. Just do what the Word says and be a servant. Serve the people. And, and people are serving themselves. And that's what has brought the division. And therefore, if they have division at the top, I think it's somewhere in, in Ephesians where it talks about the rulers in high places. Just even when they talk about our government, even when they talk about law enforcement, even when they talk about all these other things, it, it ain't the babies that's causing all this ruckus because that's when we quick to point the finger at these babies, saying they going crazy, they going to, yeah, because you haven't provided what you're supposed to. You haven't gave them adequate service to serve them. They shouldn't be starving. They shouldn't be worrying about what they're going to wear. They shouldn't be worrying about the roof over their house. 50% of our babies are in school, at a unified school, or foster care kids. That's a, that's a something shame. I ain't going to tell you that point. But that's a something shame right there. It just shouldn't happen. Um, so some would argue that this whole war on drugs has been uh, just one epic failure. And um, given that so many three-letter agencies, their budget is dependent upon you know, keeping the war on drugs alive. Um, kind of what's your thought on treating addiction uh, and treating addicts as criminals instead of addressing it from a mental health standpoint? There's no way that we could incarcerate our way out of the drug war. Uh, it, it's, it's a method for corruption. You know, um, like Warriors was saying earlier, that it's hard for uh, a cop who's barely making his payment, his rent. You know, just like me, we almost the same thing. It's hard for him to turn down somebody coming hand him back for the money with twenty, thirty thousand dollars in, and uh, you know his, his rent is due, or his house note is due. Uh, uh, so to say we can incarcerate our way out of it is, is 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 almost foolish because if you had a magic wand today and you could wipe out all the drug dealers on the planet, drug dealers, drug users would start to create their own drug dealers immediately. So there's no way that you can incarcerate your way out of it. Uh, we have to do this with education and, and addiction. Um, I believe that if we started to help people and, and give better education with the money that we spend on incarceration, we pay more to keep one inmate in prison than we pay to keep uh, for a school teacher every year. So for every inmate salary, I mean, yeah, that we pay to keep them in it. We get to hire a teacher to, 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 to teach our kids and to almost walk them through this life that they're going through. Uh, and most inmates, if they said, you know what, if you get out of jail, I'm going to give you $25,000 a year. Don't commit no more crimes. You ain't going to commit no more crimes. But our, our system is not set up to help people like that. Now you're trying to reach out to the people. Uh, we're in the streets, but the question is how can you reach out to them? Because they don't want to be, even if you go to the, well, go to the streets, they'll run away from you. How do you do that? How do you reach out to them? They, they don't run from me. They got my, my book is a bestseller right now, and it's because street people have been buying it. They're looking for answers. Uh, but nobody's really giving them answers, and, and, and most people don't want to give them the truth. Any time that they start knowing the truth and, and, and not sugarcoat it and, 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 and tell them something that, that's, that's not real, and then when they come up and they find out that you lied to them, then they're going to think that everything you said was a lie. So it's better to be blunt and, and truthful with them. They're going to find out anyway, and they know more stuff than, 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 than we would try to tell them anyway. They can go on YouTube and, 
and world star and, and, and get so much stuff that it's crazy. So uh, I believe that we're supposed to be blunt with our with our kids, and, and, and uh, they don't run for me. I mean, um, I just left uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and, and the, the teachers had to tell the kids to leave me alone. <laughs> because they were all over me. I mean, kind of like what the kids were today, you know, that they, they want to be around somebody who, who they feel really genuinely care about. Them. Are we really, really wanting to stand up for what's right? And, and I think that a lot of people have a problem with that. They say, no, it, it ain't me. So they don't stand up for it. But it, it, it's gonna knock on your doorstep when you do that. You can believe that. A lot of people in our history that we celebrate that you know, been involved in bootlegging, um, been involved in uh, moving arms, enslaving people. What is it going to take for us to have a movement to where our government and our people start restoring our communities in the same way that if we go bomb a third world country, we, we rebuild? So, in your minds, what is it going to take to get you know our cities, the urban communities, rebuilt because of their involvement? And you know some of the things, you know, the drug trafficking. What, what would it take for that to, to to come to light in your minds? I think that we have to start holding everybody accountable or nobody accountable. Okay. Uh, I think that if you allow to put out a record and sell drugs on a record, then you should be prosecuted. Okay. Universal Records should not be allowed to sit up in a big office and pay Jay-Z and Rick Ross and all these other guys to sell drugs on records so that the young kids will believe that selling drugs is cool and they benefit from the young kids going out selling drugs because then they can buy their records. <clears throat> they can't buy their records if they don't sell drugs. So I think those people should be held just as accountable as, uh, as the guy on the street selling drugs. I mean, uh, like Gary Webb said, and he's just as just as guilty. You, you, you just as guilty. All, all I did selling drugs, all I did was tell guys to go and sell drugs. I didn't touch the drugs. I didn't cook them. I did the same thing that they do, but they get away with it. They don't have to pay a price. And as long as you allow people to do that, then they're going to keep making it look as if it's cool to sell drugs and our kids are going to keep falling in those same traps. So that's my opinion, and that's the contradictory that, uh, that I see. It's bigger than even uh, Ronald Reagan and them allowing the drugs to come into the country. They say that's called Bible. That's Bible talk right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meaning that, again, I would go back to Ephesians, one of my favorite. That is the rulers in high places. I think when they're talking about accountability, I have an example of that. When I did the search warrant on Ron Lester, I came up with a document. It's a contract with the uh, commander of the death squad in El Salvador. In that contract, they were offering former CIA operatives, black box experts, uh, naval officers, you name it, they were being offered, and next to each name was the amount of money that they were to be paid. These individuals were going to go down to El Salvador and work with a commander down there who was, at that time, was called Escuadron de la Muerte, Death Squad. This guy was the commander of it. My brother-in-law at the time was from El Salvador, and I showed him the document. This was already getting ready to go to prison. I was indicted in a whole bit. So he said, give me that document. I know people from El Salvador that want this because they can prove now that the United States was active in El Salvador. So I gave him the document as I was being moved around from prison to prison. When I got to one prison, I got a call or called my sister and she said, Manuel said to tell you the letter's been delivered. And by the way, this story is in Gary's Webb's Dark Alliance. I said, okay, great. And he said, they said to tell you thank you. It's going to be useful. I was moved to another prison. When I got to the other prison, the counselor called me in and said, there's been a death in your family. That's it. Nothing else. There's been a death in your family. I didn't know if it was one of my sons. At that time, my son Nicholas had gone into Aliso Village, was at that time had the highest murder rate of any city in Los Angeles. <clears throat> and it was dealing drugs. 
The very thing I went to prison for drugs drove him to Aliso Village. The people that were protecting him were gang members that you, his parents, were both cops. And this guy was taking care of him. In any event, I finally talked to the counselor and she said, your brother-in-law was found strangled and shoved into a trunk of a car. My brother-in-law was six foot four, weighed 210 pounds, and he loved to fight. So obviously it was more than one individual. He had been tortured and then shoved into the trunk of the car. The way it was written by the LAPD, it was a drug sale gone bad, and that's why he was murdered. The document had been delivered two weeks prior by him to the uh, rebels in El Salvador. So now who's accountable? Is it our government? Is it the drug dealers? Is it the police for not doing their job? You know, we talk about Gary Webb committing suicide, shooting himself twice. Even this gentleman down here said, how do you do that? <laughs> I saw the photograph of the bullet holes. They got it right, they're on the left side of his face because he was left-handed. There's a bullet here and one just below it. The first round would have been enough to put him in a shot, he would have dropped the gun. So who's accountable now? See, that's one thing we all have to ask ourselves. Who's accountable? Am I accountable for what happened to my sons? Yes. Are you accountable for what happens in your neighborhood? Maybe yes and maybe no. Are these guys accountable for what happened when they were dealing drugs? They accept responsibility as well as I do. How much responsibility are you willing to accept? Something to think about. We have a question right here from one of our students. Um, the the question I have, it kind of ties into the accountability and the responsibility part. Um, do you guys regret anything that you did in the past, like anything that you have done to live up to this moment? Myself, I regret everything. I, 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 if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't do it, period. I mean, I wouldn't want to see no, no more. I think what Coach is trying to say is we all regret what we've done. I regret the fact that I got involved in what sent me to prison. I don't regret the people that I've met. I don't regret meeting these two guys. I've learned a lot from them. You have to be able to go out and meet people and have different experiences without breaking the law. And there's ways to do that. And education is one of them, as we all learned up here. Take us back 20 years, put us on the street. I've got a gun, he's got a gun. We're going to shoot each other to death. Now we're sitting up here trying to tell you how to avoid it. Especially you guys. You know, you can have a beautiful funeral when you're a gangbanger and you went down shooting, but you're dead. You're never going to see that funeral. You're not going to know what kind of music they played. You're not going to know who was laughing and who wasn't. So why do you do it? What are you taking with you? Nothing but the dirt they're going to bury you with. Uh, as for me, I don't know if regret is the correct word to use. Um, would I do it again knowing what I know now, today? No. But the experience that I have gotten out of my life is invaluable. Uh, I had the privilege of having dinner with a minister, Louis Farrakhan, who's, in my opinion, one of the smartest men in the world. Um, and he told me not to regret what I went through. He said that I have to look at my life as a scientist, that everything that I went through, if I use it for the betterment of mankind, then I could be considered a scientist. So I don't know if regret is the correct word uh, because I wouldn't give my prison sentence back if I could. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't give my drug dealing time back if I could uh, because I wouldn't be the person who I am today 
and I definitely love who I am today. Um, I think I have a, a mission uh, in the world to accomplish, um, and that's how I feel about it. When I was looking at my uncle smoke crack through the little week when we were kids, they had a little keyhole. You can look in the bathroom in the keyhole, and I saw my uncle in the bathroom freebasing and uh, in a glass and filled up with white smoke. And I was about eight or nine years old, and then, you know, 10 years later, I became this drug dealer. And uh, uh, I always thought about doing it, but never did, but didn't realize that I was doing it. Why? Because if he was smoking, he spent $25 to put in something and it, and it fuzzed up in a cup like this, and I'm cooking 200 kilos every day, every other day. Who's getting hired, me or him? So it went in my system, who supposedly never smoked crack, into my wife's system. And as you can see, my daughter was born as a crack baby because the doctor came to us and said, hey, you got a crack baby. Who, who, who smokes crack? Did your wife? Did you, do you? I said, no. And so, uh, you know, to go in there and to Martin Luther King Hospital, and I said, hey, I want to see her. And uh, she weighed uh, two pounds. Always tough to talk about. But if that was in the turning point, the turning point is that when you walked into that room, there was hundreds of crack babies who were just mm -hmm. In bringing the panel to a close, this has been a, a very intense and cerebral round table, probably one of the toughest that I've participated in in a very long time. Uh, Rick, I just want to take about two or three minutes and give you some space to talk about how you're putting reform into social action. What is it that you're doing today? We know that you just got off the plane two seconds ago from Jacksonville, Florida. You're talking to youth. You're going into detention centers. You uh, established your own t-shirt line. You just written a book. I mean, you have a lot of projects that's going on. Tell us about how you're moving forward. Well, I think it's very important that, that, that our kids get exposure. I think exposure is uh, so, so important for, for everybody. Um, you know, it's amazing that there's kids in South Central LA who stays in the Nickerson Down and the Jordan Downs who've never been to the beach. And the beach is only about seven miles away. Uh, and I, I did, a lot, when I was in prison, I did a lot of reading the newspapers and I read one time in the paper that they said that a kid that goes two or three miles away from their house does better academically than a kid that never leaves his community. And after I started reading and, and, and exploring all these different places, I could understand why. Because <laughs> if you only see what's going on in your community, then you start to believe that this is the whole world. See, I believe that South Central was the whole world and everything in the world worked just like South Central was working. You know, I didn't understand that there was other avenues, other ways of generating income and, you know, people who, who didn't walk around with guns, uh, people who weren't afraid of, of, of getting killed, um, people who, who had never stole a car, people who had never sold drugs before. Uh, I didn't understand that. Um, and I believe that <coughs> we as a society have to bring our kids to getting more exposure so that they will understand that, that there's other avenues, that there's other opportunities to, uh, to explore. And that's what I try to bring uh, to the ghettos. Uh, my experience, um, my knowledge of what I've learned from everything that I've been through and hopefully that they don't have to go down the same uh, road that I went through, and uh, that's why I do what I do. That's why I go to juvenile halls um, and travel the country. Right now, we're working on a, a program where we can start uh, getting 
uh, my three favorite books, the kids. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, if somebody would have told me this when I was in prison, it would be this hard to get books uh, for guys in jail. Uh, I would have never believed it. But uh, nobody wants to help. Uh, I mean, when, when I go to these jails and I talk to these guys about and ladies about these books, they all want them. But they're in prison and they, they, they most of them have burned their bridges with their families, so they don't have family members that will reach out and, 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 and support them. And a lot of times it winds up being me, uh, you know, buying 10 books for the whole prison that they have to share uh, with each other. I mean, even, the, even the, the jails, they don't understand the importance of taking some of their budget, buying books that could enlighten uh, uh, people's minds, you know. Um, and I think that those are just some of the things that, that, that we could start doing immediately. I mean, um, my three favorite books, I don't know if you ever heard of them, but I'll tell you what they are anyway. Uh, the Richest Man in Babylon by George Classy, uh, Thinking World Rich by Napoleon Hill, and As a Man Think and As a Woman Think. Uh, these books were like magic to me. Uh, I recommended them yesterday. <laughs> to the people that I spoke to yesterday, I recommended all the kids get them. Uh, and I explained to them how important those books were and what those books did to me. Those books showed me how to go back over my life, analyze my life, and take those same skills. I heard somebody say, transferable skills. Well, everything that I do right now are skills that I learned from the drug business. Me in the courtroom. When I was in the courtroom, dealing with the judge, my lawyer, and the prosecutor, I was using skills that I had learned from the drug business. Now, I had started learning the law, what this law meant, what that law meant, but I still was using the skills that I had learned from the drug business. When I go to board meetings right now and meet with some of the biggest people in Hollywood and um, universities, I'm using my same skills that I learned from the drug business. These skills are universal. They are transferable. The same skills that you use to sell drugs, you need those same skills to sell cars, houses, wood, water, whatever it is, they are the same skills. And, and, and I believe that uh, that's why I've been having somewhat of success because those skills are transferable. Excellent. Close remarks, uh, Cornell and Robert. Well, uh, again, I just want to say thank you to the university. Uh, thank you for all the folks, and, and particularly, I, I, if, if nobody told you, young babies, man, I love you guys, you know, uh, and I hope the best for you. Uh, again, you can reach me uh, on the website, uh, Unity One Foundation, Inc. Uh, my cell number is there, my email is there. If you'd like to support us, uh, definitely can feel free to do so. It ain't, all, it ain't about money. It's about resourcing, building uh, uh, relationships, and that's what I look forward to. Again, Coach Ward. I just want to thank you all for having me here. I want to thank my sons in particular. They are the driving force that puts me up here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. They're also the driving force behind our new documentary that's called Raised by the Badge. It's going to get into detail about my marriage to a police officer and what happened to her and to me when I committed a crime and obviously what happened to my children. So thank you again for having me. Excellent. Please, let's put our hands together.